You're listening to the Finding Careers End podcast. I'm Pete Newsom, and my guest today is Dr. Josh Hammonds. Josh, how are you today? I'm doing very well, Pete. Thanks so much for having me on. This is great. Uh, and we've talked about this for a little while, not too long, because we just met over LinkedIn before we met in person just a couple of weeks ago. So this is great to be able to interview you live and in yes. person. <laughs> LinkedIn, bringing, bringing neighbors together that they didn't know they were neighbors, right? We're both here in the same city, so that's great. Pure coincidence, right? But we didn't waste any time meeting live, and what, what, a, what a great uh, thing that was. And I'm so excited to not only have a new um, person to, to give a very interesting perspective on some things that are talked about a lot, but to have a, a new friend and in and, and contact, and, and it's just how LinkedIn should work, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, well, bridge, bridging the commonalities, the things that we have uh, sort of same em energy on and uh, same interests. So it's really, great. Really cool small world stuff. Um, and so you are, your PhD is in organizational communications. It is. It is. Yes. I, I received my PhD in organizational communication several years ago, uh, back in 09. And I've been a, uh, a working professor researcher for uh, ever since then. So for several years now, and my my area of research really does focus on kind of the the human communication element that happens within companies, within organizations, within leaders and their teams. And so a lot of the coursework and the research that I do looks at what drives employees to want to work, to, to want to be engaged, and then what strategies and tactics can leaders do to connect with, inform, and influence uh, the people that you lead towards productivity, towards life fulfillment in their careers, in their roles, towards engagement in general. So um, that's that's most of my work has focused on and then done quite a bit of consulting and even uh, working uh, with different companies on assessing things like employee engagement and what drives employees to want to go to work and their capacity and, and things like this. So definitely, you know, the, the early part of my career was focused much more on the academic and the research part, but over the last six or seven years, I've put a lot of time and energy working in a different kind of classroom in organizations and in companies, which, which I get so much uh, fulfillment from as well, so. It's, it's easy to comprehend everything you just described, right? <laughs> easy for you to say, of course, a lot of, a lot of uh, that went into you know, your, your education to getting to uh, the level of knowledge you have now, but incredibly difficult to implement. And, you know, the, what, what your specialty in, I think is what businesses everywhere, probably the biggest struggle that businesses have, you know, uh, when it comes to employees specifically, mm. would you would you agree with that? Yeah, I I, I think so, and, and and I'm biased because I've been studying the field and the discipline of communication for a long time, and so when my worlds collided with with business practices and leadership, the big chasm that I saw that was missing was why aren't we teaching people how to communicate? Why why aren't you using strategies and communication tactics to motivate, to influence, and to inform the people that you're leading and and so it was just a great kind of right place at the right time where I said, I've got all this communication background of like how indirect versus direct messaging work. And what does it look like to find relational overlaps and use those into one-on-ones as you also talk about performance and good kinds of feedback versus ineffective forms of feedback. And so um, to me, I, th I, th I think if you ask the average leader that, you know, what is it that you're missing? What would you need more of? A lot of people say communication, but for me, studying it for so long, I just said, oh, let's, let's connect these dots in some way. But yeah, I think it's certainly needed for sure. Why is it so hard for us? Is <sighs> it generational? It, yeah, that's something that I think about a lot because yeah. I'm Gen X and I, you know, use, for the most part, fall straight in line with uh, you know, the cliches of Gen X. Mm -hmm. The millennials came along, a lot of changes in the workplace. I didn't personally necessarily adapt to those changes um, right. as well as many did, right? I'm sorry, right. my ways, my perspective, not un completely uncommon. Then we have the boomers, right? Who are even older than me, even sure. set in their ways. Is is that it? Or is there is there mm. much more to it? Is this always been a problem? Yeah. Has has communication always, has, has communication synergy always been a problem? You know, um, I think it's fascinating. I think it's one of those behaviors, you know, when, when we say, I want to, I want to learn how to play an instrument, you recognize where you're at on your competencies. And then you say, I need, teach me everything. So let's start with the fundamentals. Then let's build off this theory. And then let's, 
let's work towards this so that I can perform to my best ability in this instrument. But with communication, we always have done it since the age of 18 months on that we just always assume that we've got this. I, I know how to talk. I know, I know how to communicate. Right. And so I think that that's part of it is that there's this, I've been doing it so long. It would be quite humbling to say, I need communication training. No, I don't. Right. You're, you're the problem. I'm not the problem. So that's the first part. But then secondly, I think communication shows us how different we really are. And so I think a lot of people that I talk to say, teach me how to be a great communicator take me from zero to a hundred. Sure. You know, maybe someone's vulnerable enough to do that. And then I also have to remind people that sometimes the way that you communicate is makes sense to you and your brain and, and your culture, but this person, the way that they communicate might be completely different. And so you'll have a meeting where someone will, someone will be a communicator and you'll have four different interpretations of what was said, how it went down, what they actually meant. And so I think, I think the big epiphany is that people communicate differently because we see the world differently. Sure. And, and we have a different psychology and perspective about things. And it's just obvious with communication because it's, this is what's coming out of, of how I think about things with my communication. So that's why you get these two ships passing in the night because people are wired differently and I'm going to match the style of communication and how I think and, and my perspective. That's why we're not communicating well, because we're different people. And so let's first admit that and then, and then build off that. Is there is there anything that makes it a, a specific more, specifically more challenge at work than it mm. is perhaps in other as, aspects of life? Uh, we, what we're going to talk about today, I could get I, I knew this was going to happen. We're already going down. We're already path, right. So I I, I want to I do want to bring it back to what we're supposed to talk about today, which is burnout in the workplace. Yeah. Of course, that you're leading on that. But yeah. before we get in into that, let me just ask this. It, why is it different at work? Why is mm -hmm. you know, what we, what goes so well for us in other aspects, aspects of life just becomes you know, much harder when, when we're in the office environment? Oh, I think, oh, wow. Where do I start with that? I, I think that's a good question. I, th I think with all, all forms of communication, always there's a task element and a, re and a relational element. So there is the task element, which is I need to be clear with my information and give directives and, and give give the objectives that need to happen. And, and I'm clear and I understand what you said. And so there's that element, but then there's also what I sometimes we don't think about is there's a, there's a relational or a cultural element. There's, there's, as I'm talking to you, there's, there's tone and I'm building a culture and I'm building a climate and I'm building on a relationship as I communicate it as well. And so the best communicators will understand that both of these are necessary in different capacities. And so from a work perspective, I have to be very informative and very clear but then also need to be a great listener and 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 understanding and empathic and relational at the same time. And if I can if I can get both of those with my team, then I've got a great successful team. But not everybody is necessarily an ambidextrous communicator and can handle both of those, right? And so I think with work, the greatest leaders have a grasp on on both of those. And usually when I do any kinds of training or educating, it's all right, which side do you favor on so that I can help you with the other, the non-dominant hand, if you will? So that, that's really interesting because I think you can be, you can be an effective communicator in certain circumstances, but, mm -hmm. a, but a terrible communicator in, in others. And I, that's been a struggle for me personally, as mm -hmm. we talked about off camera, where as a, as a salesperson, a career salesperson, I've been a, a very effective communicator, but I know at times with younger professionals as a leader, I have not been, and I see it in the body language, right? I see it in the, in oh, the yeah. as you, you just see the reaction and say, this is not resonating, right? This right. message is that I'm delivering. It's coming out one way, but it's being received yep. in an entirely different way. And I think that's, I hope that's common. I, I think it is. Sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And so that, you know, when I do my assessments, I'm like, all right, where, where are we out on the spectrum as a communicator so that I know that, all right, I no longer need to spend any time talking about being a concise, clear community. You've got that down. Great. When you deliver information, it's direct, it's clear, it's assertive, it's concise. Now let's focus on this, right? And then, and then other people have to, I have to flip-flop and, and teach them being direct, how to be direct, how to be assertive. You've, you've got the relational element down. Everybody loves you as a boss, as a leader, but every, but people are confused and they're not hitting their, their numbers and their, the deadlines are off, but you know, and so. 
Do you think that, um, the, so there's a responsibility for the, the, the person you know, doing the speaking and there's some mm-hmm. level of responsibility uh, that has to lie with the person who's doing the listening, right? Oh, certainly. How, how, do you think that has been a change because uh, over the, over the years where messages, you know, we, we live in a different time, uh, that existed 20, 30 years ago, right? Mm-hmm. It, short attention spans, information comes at us so quickly, so much of it. I mean, I feel that oh. the day is so much shorter today, even though I may work longer hours than it was 20 years ago. Yeah, It's a struggle. And so now we have people who are, are you know, professionals in the work workforce. No one intends to be a bad communicator, right? So we know right. that. Right. Uh, but do you think that the, the way messages are received today are different than how they were received 20, 30 years ago. I, I do. And, and I'll hit on just two things you said. I think the first thing is, yeah, we've, we've got so many more channels coming at us at once, right? Did you did you check my message? Uh, did you Slack it? Did you text it? Did you email it? Is that a video I'm supposed to watch? Remind me when you say my message, to what channel is this coming at me? And so, right. yes, I think I think with, with the abundance of channels, now we have some confusion on clarity. Whereas back in the day, it was like, we said it in the Monday meeting. That was the only time you saw me. And, and, and that's where you got that message versus all these different mediums that happen. So there's a clarity issue there. But I, I think secondly, as the work life boundaries continue to erode, and I, I don't think it's going anywhere. I think it's going to continue being more integrated more and more and more, right? You're checking on your phone after dinner and things like this. As those boundaries erode, people are wanting more from their organizations. And so if I'm spending more frequent, intermittent, frequent times with my team on a project, you know, we're hitting a deadline. So we've got a big sprint coming up. So we've spent so many hours together that your work then does become part of your community. And there's a lot of people that do long for or want a culture or a climate that they can feel comfortable in, feel safe in, be creative with, right? Because so much of our work is wrapped up into our identity. If, if you're successful at work and you get to use your strengths at work, that feels good. That's part of who you are. And so then I also then want the communication to be supportive in that way. And I want feedback regularly. And I want you to tell me when I'm doing great, just as much as what I probably need to work on. So I think the demand of the leader who, who maybe has been leading teams for the past 30, 40 years is going, what's in the water? What's changed? Well, what's changed is people are wanting more from their teams in their organizations, more so than they ever have, because they're spending so much more time and it's and it's it's blending more into their actual real lives as well. It, it, well, it has. I mean, working from home certainly hasn't done anything to lessen that. It's only exacerbated it. And finding that separation is hard, which is a really good segue into what I told you um, the, the purpose of today would be, or I asked you to speak about, which is <laughs> your new your new course on burnout. And yeah. and you is from what you shared with me, it's uh, you're 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 t- leading it from two different perspectives. You're teaching it mm-hmm. from two different spe- perspectives. How you can help leaders be better at, at controlling that something that I certainly need, uh, you know, could use some help with, um, but also how individuals, and that's what we're going to focus on today yeah. can handle it, you know, manage it for themselves. Right. Yeah. Because I, I think at, at some level, we all have to take responsibility for our own actions, our own uh, perspective on things. Right. I, I mean, you, you and I, I think the day we met, we ended up talking a little bit about stoicism and how, you know, how I say something is one thing, how you receive it, that's on you, right? Sure. How that makes sure. you feel. Um, and so burnout, is it, you know, what is it? Let's start there. Because right. we're, we're talking about, we want to help people with burnout. I yeah. don't want to feel burned out. I suspect I make them feel burned out, whether I intend to or not. Right. Right. I think, you know, it's, and so it's a great question. What What is burnout? I think that question is what started my entire quest several months ago, about, about eight months ago, really started to dive deep into it because we just use that term all the time. I'm, oh, I'm so burnt out. You, you, you worked on a project for an hour and you'll just get up from it and go, oh, I'm burnt out. I gotta go. I gotta go take a walk. It's like, and so when you use that word always, then it, then it doesn't mean anything. It just means you're tired. It just means you're a little bit stressed. And so what does that word actually mean? And so I, I delve deep into the research and we see this in the literature for the first time about 1982 and, and Christina Maslach and her team were, were doing lots of research on physician burnout and, and different kinds of workplace burnout. And she was able to really come to a nice definition, which I really like. And then, and then I took it another step further, but um, she says, and I want to get this right, the term burnout 
is a syndrome involving experiences of emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and then reduced self-accomplishment while at work. So she she combines this sort of large nebulous idea that if you're really burned out, you're experiencing these sort of symptoms. And so I took that next step further and looked at several more studies and then conducted my own study. And I found out that there's really about four different types or four different dimensions of burnout. And so there are the physical burnout cases where I have been working back-to-back meetings, 16-hour days for about a week. I am physically just burnt out and I need rest and I got to take a break. And so the study that I published uh, that Microsoft did uh, back at right after the pandemic, right, um, showed that individuals who took just even a 10 minute break in between their back to back meetings showed a massive reduction in the stress version uh, brain waves that were emitted. And so if you could just rest for that moment, go take a walk and come back, you'll see a reset in your brainwave stress uh, activity. And so that's that's a that is a thing, physical burnout. However, just because you're physically exhausted does not necessarily mean that you are or experiencing workplace burnout. And so I wanted to go a little bit deeper into that. And so the the second one that I found um, was this idea of depersonalization or mental burnout. And that's that's the one we saw really crop up during the pandemic. And 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 depersonalization or mental burnout it says that like my mind is no longer at, at work. I am mentally checked out. And so uh I've I've called this sort of the, the purpose problem that you no longer see a meaning or purpose in the work that you're doing. And we saw so many people during the great resignation, not only leave their jobs, they left their industries, right? You had teachers becoming uh, tech sales people, right? And so you saw everybody just switching because they woke up one day and say, is this what I want to do? Does this matter anymore? I, I no longer see myself as an accountant. I don't know why I'm an accountant. Why did I even pick this? And so, and, and a global pandemic can certainly rattle a few cages to ask big questions, certainly like, why am I doing this? What am I doing? Right. But, but mental burnout is that, that I lost, I've lost the meaning. And so, and so diagnosing that there's, there's different treatments for that cause than there would be that, Hey, you just need to take a break. I, I love my job, but you're working 16 hour days you got to rest. You take two days off and do not uh, answer your phone at all. Right. And so those are different treatments for that. And then the third one, which I think maybe is the most problematic, this is attitude burnout and attitude burnout really starts to creep up when you notice cynical uh, attitudes. And so you no longer are, you know, you've got a, you've got a quick tongue at, at work. You, you've got a couple of toxic sidebar conversations that are happening. And really the root of this is you have not felt recognized or valued in a long time. Okay. And recognition can come intrinsically and extrinsically, right? It could be that I've not gotten a raise or a pay increase in years and I have been busting my butt right? Could be that kind of value, but it also could be nobody has really even spoken to me about how valuable I am or even recognized me publicly or in front of my team on how much I do here. And so when that starts to happen, you start getting really cynical. Why am I here? Right? And so I am, I'm in a bad place. I am, I am saying things that I shouldn't, I'm feeling things that I shouldn't. And so that that's an attitude burnout that that to me is, is the yellow, if not orange flag, that if you don't start having conversations with your leadership or doing some real, uh, either going out and get some coaching or talking to somebody through this, it might be time for you to hit eject because that that one is tough to sort of turn around and and do it. And then and then the last one, the fourth fourth type of burnout is this idea of skill burnout. And skill burnout says that I I don't feel like I have the resources or or the tools or the skills to accomplish what I used to be able to accomplish. And and that starts happening when the tech evolution has increased. And so everything from machine learning to AI, you know, all of these new integrations. So if you've been at your job for 20, 30 years, or if you're in leadership and all of a sudden the tools are accelerating at a pace that is quicker than what you're picking up on or your ability to use them, you might feel inadequate. And so that's a skill burnout. Uh, system. And and again, that's a different treatment. That's a, I need to take a week off, go do a professional development course in AI, learn what chat GPT is, how to use it for a company. And I'll be back because I'm feeling inadequate at my own abilities uh, at this time. And so again, so, so that's a long way of answering your question, but I, I do see it as these four primary buckets 
that once you're diagnosed with like, okay, my, my issue is, is, is attitude burnout. You're right. That's exactly what it is. I still have lots of meaning and purpose. I'm not exhausted. I just don't feel appreciated. And that's why I'm burnt out. And that's why, you know, that's, what's feeling this. So, so each time you have a, a cause to these burnouts, you know, there's a different treatment that, that you should be taking. So it sounds like step one is to identify the problem. Absolutely. Like, like anything. So on the surface of so skill burnout to me, doesn't sound like the same category as the other three when we're calling it burnout versus some better way of phrase saying we're being left behind, right? Or right. Being inadequate, perhaps. It is, it is. But if if let's say um let's say we've decided to switch over to a whole new platform to do the job you've been doing for 10 years, we've got a whole new platform. And there's a training seminar, they're coming in and we're gonna do a huge change change over and uh, make sure you take the online classes and then you need to be ready by Monday morning to do that. Your learning curve, depending on where, you know, how set you are, you could be very frustrated for those first three or four months during that change that you're going, I, I don't know if I want to learn something new. I don't know if I can learn something new and I cannot catch up and I am, I'm burnt out trying to stay ahead of, of this evolution of curve, but, but you're right. It is a different kind of burn. It, do, it doesn't involve the attitude or necessarily even the meaning or purpose. You're just exhausted trying to learn a new skill. But that, that explanation puts it in a really good perspective and it, it makes more sense to me Okay, hearing it that way, because uh, your example of AI was perfect for that, where mm. here we are with this thing, you know, going at a million miles an hour, the train, is not only out of the station, it's it's well down the, the tracks at this it point. It is. And if you've been in your role for a long time or, or worked really hard to get to mm -hmm. a point, I mean, I'm watching uh, some college graduates come out now. They've just it, it spent four years getting a degree in something that has almost been rendered moot by some of the new technology that's yeah. out. And you have that on one spectrum. The other end of the spectrum are people who've been in their profession a long time who are yeah. now being told to your point, you, you have to relearn how to do everything. Yeah. New That's, payroll system. Good luck. De you know, department of five. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that you, happens, you've got a week <laughs> right throughout everyone's career. I mean, the technology I use every day didn't exist you know, when I came out of college, needless to say, some of the technology I use didn't exist when we came into 2023. So it it's, it's a constant thing and it does, I, I, I get it. Right. I get that feeling. I don't, you know, it, but let me ask you. So when you're teaching yeah. leaders, yeah, is it, do you, do you, you know, give is the guidance to anticipate each of these things, know what signs and symptoms to look for and then how to deal with it. But back to identification being the first step, I think, yeah. Do you plant that, you know, of, is it anticipation or is it reaction? Uh, yeah. That That's a great them. question. Yeah, I think the the best one is to have a proactive, right? So, so maybe you're leading a team and you've been thinking they might be burnt out, but you're not sure if it is burnout or if it's a different kind of burnout, right? Just explaining these different styles, you'll see the light bulbs go off. And go, oh, you're right. This one's cynical, but this one no longer finds purpose in it. Now, oh, that makes sense. And so, just giving it giving it a, a category, giving it a name talking about the symptoms, talking about the different treatment can help a leader sort of be a little bit proactive so that when they see these signs coming, right, it doesn't get to that point, right? If, if you're at a point of cynicism, something broke way over here before, you know, you didn't wake up with a cynical attitude ready to, you know, ready to to, to be toxic at every, you know, water cooler conversation that that no one wakes up doing that. There was There were signs before there, and it might've been physical exhaustion, I worked, you know, for two months on this project and no one said anything and no one gave me the the recognition that I deserved. Right. And so getting ahead of that is always going to be the best plan if I, you know, if I'm leading a team. So, so of the four, one of them is, you know, physical, it is physical, right? right. That is not something that um, we can control. The other three, to what degree are they self-imposed? Yeah, that's, I, I think that's a great question. So, what if I am leading a team and this team no longer finds meaning or purpose in their role? So now as a leader, right, am I seriously responsible for talking that account, my accountant 
into seeing the purpose and the meaning of their role. Like that, that's your issue. If you no longer see the meaning, that's your issue. And so there's a part of that, that yes, it, it's on that person, but as their leader, could you help connect those dots? Right. And so one of the ways that, that we, that we do this, or I talk about doing this, the control that you might have, the only actionable thing that you might have is say, let's sit down and ask, let's have a one-on-one -on -one with, with the people that I'm leading and say, let's see what your role is and make sure that your role is very clear because sometimes you know, scope creep happens and you're no longer doing accounting. You're, you're doing 17 other things. You love accounting. You find great meaning in accounting. It's the 48 other things that I've now acquired over the past six months because of hybrid work, because of all these sorts of things. So having that role clarity conversation could bring it back in. Maybe, maybe they do love accounting. They're just doing so much that isn't accounting, right? So having that conversation and then also having conversations about like, look, here is the purpose the vision and the mission of this company. This is why you joined us. This is what makes us different. Let me remind you of that and see if that brings any more clarity and things like that as well. And so those are two things you can do as a leader, um, but you're right. Ultimately, if somebody wakes up and says, I don't want to be this anymore. And then you can, I think a good leader should help the transition into even if that's another company, right? Great leaders don't just care about their own organization, but hopefully they, they care for the growth and development of people. And that's why they're in that business, people leadership. That, that makes complete sense. As, as the individual who experiences this, maybe, maybe not knowing what words to put to it, but we, we feel it, right? We all know what dread feels like. Oh, yeah. We all know that feeling. I mean, I, I've <laughs> talked about it many times over the years being in, in the staffing industry hmm. where the second you decide you're going to quit, right? I mean, we've put the you know, quiet quitting has been talked about so much. It, it, that's oh, a whole, yeah. little bit different to me. But where, when, you've, when, you've, when you're checked out and you're, you know there's no coming back from it, every day, every minute feels like torture yeah. from that moment forward. So we know it when yeah. we, we feel it, even if we can't put... You know, words and phrases you know, attached to it, how, how much control does the individual really have over um, being, you know, is, is there a way to, to repair the situation, uh, generally speaking, or when that exists, it's time to leave, right? Like yeah. if you're this, you know, just in this accountant scenario, yes, you like doing accounting, times have changed. Now we're working at home. Now we've had to scale back. The business has evolved. This mm -hmm. is normal. This is stuff that happens. Yep. But you know, do we need to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Right. Or, right? or do we, you know, is part of it, hey, you know what? I need to uh, isolate the things I don't like. I need to put them in a silo, identify yep. them for what they are, and just yes, and just deal with it. I, I think it's always worth having a conversation with your leader, with your manager. Before, before you bounce, because you don't know what opportunities could be brewing up. And so having a conversation, I've, I've got this questionnaire guideline is, is a bore out or burnout, right? And so I encourage people to take this questionnaire, not only to do a self-reflexive with themselves, but then take that with their manager. Are there opportunities that exist, task forces, strategy sessions that I could be involved in or get involved in that would, that would ignite more passion and interest in me? So Chances are, if you've been there for a while, you know what you like and you know what you don't like. And so having that conversation, I, I've I've worked with tech companies before where somebody who was in sales just very much didn't see that anymore, but had a passion for product and creativity. And so they kept grafting this way, this way until they finally said, let's make the lateral move. We're hiring people in product. Why don't we make this move? You already know the company. We already know you're a diligent worker. And so having that conversation with your manager saying, here's what I'm passionate about. These are the strengths that I would like to be challenged on and see if I can't increase my performance in that way. Are there opportunities and, or do you see opportunities in the near future? Maybe, maybe not today, but are there openings? And then having that conversation and then your manager can go, absolutely not. That will never happen for you. This is why we hired you. Right. And then, and then you can go shopping and, and, and amicably exit and find out what that is. But having that conversation with manager, I mean, companies are changing so much and the skills required and the competence required are, are, are always shifting and changing. So, you know, the bottom line is know yourself well enough to know what the things that you do that you like to do and, and bring that to your manager just to see if there are opportunities. Well, and problems, can't be fixed unless they've 
been identified. And right. I, that's something that I, it, it's easier said than done. I, I, where I encourage everyone talk to your manager, just like you said, share that concern, do it in the right way at the right time, right? Yeah. Do it professionally, yeah. but don't dwell on it mm. and don't leave uh, what could otherwise be a good situation that was a good situation could be again, because you chose that path of leaving versus trying to do something about it, right? Because we know the grass isn't necessarily greener. And in many right. cases, it's right. I, I wish I had the stat, but the number of people that left during the great resignation, it was, it was a large portion of people went, oops, <laughs> you know, and so it's uh, it, grass. Yeah. Grass is greener. Well, and, and that scenario has created um, a mess for lack of a better way to put it, that we're still dealing with yeah. right now because the pendulum is, is making some pretty big swings or has been over the last couple of years. And there's a lot of really talented folks caught on the wrong side of that right now yeah. where they made a move. It was in their interest to do it. And, and, and it was short term, right? Some of the biggest, yeah. you mentioned tech companies, some of the biggest tech companies hired a lot of people, let a lot of people go. Now they're hiring some of them back. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's you, you have to take responsibility for your own success and well-being in all of this to some degree, uh, or I would say to the most significant degree. Do, do you support that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, leaders should always be proactive in developing their teams. Always, right? That's what I'm always going to put the onerous of responsibility on leadership. That being said, if I'm if I'm talking to employees, individual contributors, take charge of your journey. You you should have an you should have an in depth, intimate view of what you are strong at, what you are great at, what are some things that you need to grow in, and know that about yourself. Communicate that to your to your leaders and your managers as soon as you possibly can, or as soon as it comes into your view, so that uh, you can get a, a growth plan together. You uh, know it because you've yeah. studied it, right? Yeah. I know it because I've seen it play out both as an yeah. employee and an employer. Why is yeah. it so hard to do? Why is it so hard for individuals to stop and have those conversations? Yeah. Oh, there's 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 no time. There's never time to have those conversations. Yeah, I um I, I think the the one-on-one, -on -one, a meaningful, productive one-on-one -on -one is the heart and soul of any organization. And and yeah, I, I've dealt a lot with tech companies and a lot of them were remote. So if you didn't have those, you didn't have anything. But I think we rely so heavily on this return to office movement, right? If everybody's in the office together, we all learn through osmosis and you just pick up things along the way and I can see you and there's accountability. Yeah, all, all that's good, all that's great. But if you're not having a one-on-one -on -one, for 40 minutes every other week, where the first eight to 10, how are you really doing? What's frustrating you the most? What blockers are preventing you from doing your job in the best way possible? And what resources do you need from me? If you're not framing the first eight minutes in that way, and then going through more of a systematic checking off goals, what, what you still need to do? What are some tasks? Giving some feedback. Um, I don't know how you could possibly be growing your people if you're not, if you're not engaging in those one-on-ones. From a, as a communication expert, do you think that it's those are harder to execute on, perhaps, right? Maybe less impactful is a better way to phrase it, virtually versus being in person. Do we lose something by doing that over Zoom? Yeah, I could. You know, we could we could dissect that for a while. I sure, right? In any time you go from a three D to a two D, you're you're going to lose something on that. Um, but I, I've heard of people just doing, you know turning off the cameras and, you know, just checking boxes and things like this. If, if, if you're going to use a one-on-one -on -one just to check the boxes, did you do this? Did you do this? Don't forget that. Don't forget that. See you next week. If you're just doing that and you're not having future conversations about like, all right, what are some ways we can grow you? What are some new things we could do? What are some things we could add, challenge you? If you're not doing that, then Zoom or face-to-face, -face, it doesn't really matter. But if you are engaging in those more kind of real conversations, um, I, I think Zoom works. I've seen it work really well. Um, so it's more about intentionality than it is about the medium. I think so. Right? I think with, with Zoom, it, it probably in many cases, it, it, it leads to be, being distracted. Unless you're recording yeah. like this, right? Now sure. we're, we're, we're engaged at, at this <laughs> right, right, right. because we're, we're sensitive to the camera being yeah. on. Um, but when I'm on in Zoom meetings, it, when I would go to meetings and sit around the table with someone, I wasn't looking at my phone. I didn't, wasn't you know, glancing off. I have multiple screens out right side yep. of my peripheral vision. Yep. I, 
I know I do that during meetings. I'm not as engaged. So I, uh, I, I think to your point, you have to really be conscious of that yeah. to make it effective. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, me, yeah. Meetings, you can get by with probably doing three or four things at the same time while the meeting is happening, but, but a one-on-one -on -one, I would think, yeah. If I'm asking you a direct open-ended question about what excited you this week, if anything, right. <laughs> I would think, hold on. What, you know, I, I, I would think it'd be obvious if I was quite distracted on a question that, that poignant. Well, ask my wife. She knows what yeah, she will tell you when I'm, yes. I appear to be, you know, you go in zombie mode where I'm yep. not actually retaining anything you're saying right now because, yep. because I'm not engaged. So that to your right. point, I, I completely get that. I just think it's easier to do. It's easier to fall into that mode when you're virtual. Yeah, uh, certainly. That's something to, to guard against. So, certainly. so with burnout, in this course, who, mm -hmm. who, who should consider taking it and then what are they going to get from it? It's great. Yeah. So, uh, you know, two groups. First of all, if, if you are burnt out and you need some clarity on which burnout it is and what method you should take to your manager, your therapist, your spouse, your best friend, whatever, whatever question guides, I, I think that's the first person that I'm looking for. I'm looking to help those who are stuck and they don't know how to get out of this, right? And and the answer may be it's time to move on. The answer may be time to have a hard conversation with management. You know, the answer may be some soul searching and take a week off. But but that's the first demographic. The second one is I hear a lot from CHROs, people op, people leaders, um, people ops that are going, what do we do? I don't even know where to begin. It's gotten so bad and so toxic, and or everybody's just going through the motions help? Is there a treatment out there somewhere? So maybe you're not experiencing it, but but you'll get some tools as well. So from the course, that, that's what you can expect. There's going to be four major sessions. The first session is going to look at, I will give you a diagnostic, a survey to use for you and your teams so that we can get some quantitative scores on what's the highest, what's the, what's the thing that we go, okay, well, it's not physical burnout. Great, good. Let's Let's move on. We can check that off the list. And so you'll get some scores, things like this. Each session will have uh, a homework, an activity, right? So the first, se the second session. So after you figure out what what burnout you have, the second session is going to really dive into this this purpose problem. You know, do you did you lose your meaning, or are you just adding things to your plate and it's clouding your role, right? And so we're going to have a soul searching kind of activity where. Um, similar to what we were talking about, the icky guy, you know, of, of this idea of like, what, what is the thing that you love? What is the thing that matters the most to you? What's the thing the world needs? And so there's going to be some soul searching in that session. Um, then, then the, uh, third session is going to be all about people and has your team been breaking you or making you. And so if, if you are developing attitudinal burnout, we'll look at what's the, what's the culture look like in your team? What's the feedback ratio, right? And so if you're a leader, this should be a, a kind of an awakening going, uh-oh, my team is burnt out in this way. I need to I need to be more intentional about how I give feedback. I need to be more intentional about how I'm creating a psychologically safe space that we can, we can air our grievances. We can be creative with each other. We're not fearing ramifications, right? And things like this. Because if your team, if your team is a healthy, supportive team, you can have massive physical exhaustion and demands all over the place, but there is a comfort and a solace in your team and, and it can be a buffer and create resilience with you. So your, your, your microcosm of your team is going to have as much of a buffer against any kind of burnout as anything else. And so we'll look at that. And then the fourth one is this uh, kind of performance. We'll look at performance as um, re reimagined. And so how are you being assessed on your performance as a leader or how are you assessing your team? And then, and then how are you being assessed? And so we'll look at ways that we can track goals and performance and bring in our strengths in ways that maybe we've not really assessed or looked at before. And so we'll really kind of look at that kind of performance review aspect. And so each session live interactive for an hour, um, there's going to be people chatting about their lives. We'll have a framework I'll present some research and then they'll have an action to take back to their teams or to take back if they're an individual contributor, they can take back, you know, just personally to, to, to fill out and things like this, but they're going to have tools that when they're done with the course, if they are leading a team that's burnt out, they can take their whole team through all of the materials that I give them and, and hopefully uh, get to the bottom of some of this and maybe remedy some of the burnout. That's really powerful. And, and, and I say that from a very personal uh, perspective as someone who has struggled as a leader yeah. with these things. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, I confess that to you 
yeah. uh, early on after we met. Yeah. And that's, it's not by lack of, from lack of desire. It's, it's not being armed with those tools mm -hmm. that you just described. It's mm -hmm. something, one of the reasons I'm you know, so happy to connect with you to try to absorb some of this knowledge mm -hmm. and, and to put it into practice uh, because having identified the problem long ago, doesn't mean I can solve it. Right. So while that may be the first step, there has to be follow up steps yes. or, or, yes. or no progress is made. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's comforting knowing, okay, this is what I have now. What? <laughs> right. And you said, you said it, there's so many companies right now. I have a peer group. Uh, I won't, I won't go into further detail about that because this isn't going to be the best statement that is that I that communicate with regularly uh, and leaders of organizations, and they are experiencing this. We're in different markets, mm -hmm. we different size companies, in the office, out of the office, very diverse group. But everyone, almost without exception, is struggling mm -hmm. with how do we get them? How, how as leaders, how, how do we, we? Everyone wants happy employees, right? We want yeah. a productive, happy, oh, yeah. motivated, engaged employees. But it's much, much easier said than done. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yep. So we need yep. your course. Yep. <laughs> we'll put the link in the, bio, in the show notes so, <laughs> so you can sign up, uh, of course. Um, let me have one more question, Josh, I'll, and I'll let you off oh. hook today because I already have like four or five more things I want to interview you about on a different day. That sounds great. What surprised you the most uh, through this research, uh, getting, get, putting this course together? Oh, wow. I think that's good. Um, gosh, let me think. That's a great question. Or that someone what from the outside me? in would be surprised with. Um, I don't want to give away any secrets. Maybe we have to take the course to find out. But uh, I'm curious as to something that surprised even you, given given all your background. Yeah, I think I think to me, I think I think the big the biggest thing that that surprises me is how much meaning matters to how engaged I am at work. Um, and, and again, like we were talking about before, is this a generational thing? Does it, has it, has it caught on? But, you know, you could look at somebody, you know, this is why nonprofits exist. They're, people are taking a third of the income that they could, but at the end of the day, this matters so much to me and this is why I'm doing it. And so when you, I think the last numbers I crunched was a large data set, but I think it's 68% of why you're engaged at work can be attributed to the meaning that you give. And, and then the other thing is everyone's meaning is individualized. Right. So, right. So, so if, if, if feeding the world and you join this organization and you're feeding the world and you're, you're part of this movement and that matters to you, meaning to you, that's great, but that might not matter to somebody else. And so how important it is for a company to be very transparent about this is our purpose. This is our mission. If that aligns with something that you already have intrinsic in you that drives you as well, Let's connect. Let's let's work together. Let's let's align in our mission and our meaning together. And so, I think that's such an important part. So, as as a recruiter, as somebody who's been in the recruiting business for a while, finding that alignment from the get go is important. And then, so when it when it teeters or when it falters, getting them back on. This is why we're doing this. Remember, this is why we are here, and this is why we're doing this. And so. But again, that, that could be different for everybody. For some people, it could be, I want to make a lot of money and build a legacy for me and my family and my extended family and then provide from there. Like, you know, each meaning is no nobler than someone else's meaning. And so finding everybody's meaning and getting that to align uh, is going to is going to work itself out. That drives so much of why you're engaged at work. All these other parts that we talked about, too, they matter as well. But whew, that's the big one. Well, and, and we don't do enough of that in the recruiting process as, mm. as a whole. The so I'm really glad you brought that up. Uh, it, it's it, it means a lot to me because our our internal recruiting process is to first understand the candidates' objectives before we tell them about the specific job we're recruiting them for. So while their resume is the reason for the initial phone call because it. Mm. You know, skill sets matched up, right? Background experience, whatever it might be, looks like a good fit on paper. That's just the cover of the book. Hmm. You have to open the book to, to understand what it's about, right? Yeah. And so we seek to understand what the candidates, motives, drivers, objectives are prior to telling them anything about the job. Because once we start speaking of those details, it skews the rest of the conversation. Yeah. And so we want that true answer because to your you know, the point that you just made very well, 
if those things aren't aligned, it's not going to work. Right. right. If you right. I mean, will just take something obvious, like working from home now. Yeah. People are putting that at the top of their priority list now. Yeah. Right? Not, not yeah. something you saw much of four years ago. Now, right. very common. People are quitting jobs they otherwise loved because yeah. of that very reason. So you, so you better get those relevant things on the table. And then mm -hmm. even in your accountant scenario, which I find interesting, right? Because you think of an account, you think boring job, look, you know, looking at numbers all day. Well, there's some accountants out there who say, I want to make as much money as I can for the time I spend working, right? Absolutely. That's that's one thing. Others, they want the meaning of their organization to, to, yes. to align with their interests and what they- Oh, yes. Yes, I, I, worked, I worked with an individual several months ago. And she, her passion in life was taking disorganized data and creating columns for it. Like it gave her the most satisfaction. And so there are, you know, meaning can be very different for very different people. Yeah, it, it's, um, it's, it, it, well, we've, we're going to talk more about all this because yeah. it's not a, a judgment of one in, 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 in a, trying to decide which one is better than the other, mm -hmm. but it is necessary to identify what the company offers in that particular regard, whatever that might be, and and then what the employee needs in order to avoid being burned out. Because how unfortunate is to go into a situation where the outcome is inevitably negative hmm. because of factors no individual can control, right? Right. And that it happens a lot, yeah. a lot. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is a good road to go down. We're gonna we're gonna explore it later, but for now, let's focus on uh, getting yeah, making sure everyone knows how to find your course. So, leading beyond burnout, four yep. weeks, an hour a week. When does it start? Yep, October twenty third, Monday. All right. So, we'll so if, if you miss a session, they'll all be recorded. But yeah, um, and then of course you get month long coaching, and so I'm there asynchronously. If you've got quite you've got burnout questions that are very specific. I am there to to answer as best I can what the research says and and what my experience tells. And so, yeah. Well, I can't imagine there's someone who's better for the times that we're in, whose knowledge, experience, what you know, Josh, is what we desperately need right now mm -hmm. uh, to enjoy our days more, right? To get more fulfillment out of it. And yeah. that, that's really what it's all about. Uh, so then we can enjoy life as a whole. So uh, thank you for, for your time. Thank you for what you're doing. And uh, I look forward to hearing a lot more from you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me on, Pete. Always great chatting with you, and I'm excited about further conversations down the road. Yes, indeed. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. Have a great rest of the day. All right.